So there's a push currently by pharmaceutical companies to change the traditional vaccines that we have, like childhood vaccines and all that, to an mRNA platform. And I have a lot of concerns about this. And that's because we have to really understand that this is a very different technology that might have a lot of problems associated with it. Right now, I know there are hearings in the Senate and so on to talk about possible um, side effects and risk of this technology. And it's really not clear yet how widespread that really was. And I think that needs to be discussed first. Because we have to understand that these are very, very different uh, techniques. When we think of a traditional vaccine, it's usually a weakened virus or a deactivated virus. To make the simplest, let's say you talk about uh, influenza. They usually take a, the actual uh, uh, pathogen, the flu virus, and they uh, put it into a petri dish with chicken cells. This is, of course, a simplified version of this, right? And these viruses are not very good at infecting chicken cells, very good at infecting human cells, you know, and that's why we get sick from this, right? A few will mutate to become efficient in infecting these chicken cells. And those are then taken out and put another petri dish with chicken cells until they're very much trained to really only infect chicken cells. But in the meantime, they forgot how to infect human cells. So now we have a vaccine. So now we have a virus that still looks very much the same on the outside. There are slight differences right now. Um, but it still looks like the original uh, flu virus, but it has forgotten how to infect human cells because we, we kind of bred it in these Petri dishes selectively to learn to infect chicken cells. And this vaccine, when we inject it, it usually gets into the shoulder, it stays fairly local, a little bit might become systemic, but it's very small. It's a finished particle that's actually important to understand. This is something that is a finite product. We're giving you a certain amount of these uh, viruses that have been weakened you know, or changed. Sometimes we also use parts of a virus or we use a dead virus, right? And these are all possibilities. And then the immune system sees this and does the appropriate reaction to it and produces antibodies and gets ready in case the actual pathogen then comes to have an arsenal of uh, immune cells and antibodies ready to defend uh, yourself from getting a severe infection, right? So in, in other words, to really mitigate this infection very quickly because it's prepared now. Because again, this virus, even though we trained it to infect chicken cells on the outside, looks very similar to the virus that infects humans. And so your immune system is ready now, but because this vaccine did not really cause you to become infected with it because it has forgotten how to infect your cells, there's not much risk to you in this case. And again, it's a finite product. And that's how vaccines mostly work, right? That's how we've done this for many, many years. And I'm generally okay with this. I think the childhood um, vaccine schedule has expanded quite a bit. I'm not okay with all of the items on there, but in general, I think it's good that we vaccinate against certain things. Think of the measles, mumps, rubella. I think that's a very valuable one, for example, and so on. Now, when we look at the mRNA technology, it's very different. This is not a finished particle. Actually, we give a much, 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 much smaller particle with a, you know, there's actually a, a, a lipid envelope around this tiny mRNA particle. It's about a thousand times smaller than a virus would be and it codes uh, for a certain protein. Now, this is injected, and because it's so small and easily distributed, it goes all over the body. And they've shown this early on in studies from Japan that these that the lipid nanoparticle was found in many tissues. It was found in ovaries, it's found in heart, it's found in brain and everywhere. It goes everywhere. And uh, when you have in this, in this lipid envelope, if you have in there this mRNA um, snippet, this kind of uh, genetic material, once it goes into a cell, wherever it lands, it uh, goes into the cell and it tells the cell, hey, make this protein. In the case of the COVID vaccine, it was a spike protein that was then um, implanted into the outer part of the cell. So it went through the cell membrane and stuck out. So you have your regular cell here, and then you had these spike proteins and sticking out. So now your cell on the outside looks like a virus in these parts where you have this um, uh, spike protein sticking out and the immune system recognizes that and makes antibodies. The question is, of course, well, what about the rest of the cell? If your immune system recognizes a part of the cell as being a foreign material and makes antibodies, is there risk of uh, you know, inadvertently making antibodies against the rest of the cell, which is your own cell? And of course, that's an, an autoimmune disorder and there were cases of that. But again, you know, I don't have all the statistics on that, but that's certainly a risk associated here. The other problem, of course, is it can go anywhere in the body and it can do this in any cell. And there can be problems because this protein that's produced is certainly also toxic. So there's some issues with that, right? Now, when you think of this, the issue how this is different from a traditional vaccine is, one is that, again, it's not a finite finished particle, but we know how much a person is receiving, but it is something that trains your own cells to make this. And how long this production lasts was actually a bit hard to predict. Initially, it was said, oh, days to weeks, but now it seems like months to even many months, actually, six months or more. And that might be an issue because we don't know how much of, this, um, of, these, sorry, of these antigens are actually then produced. 
that your body reacts and makes antibodies towards, right? So one, we can't really control how much of these um, antigens are being made and they have a certain toxicity associated with them, of course. Also, we don't really control where in the body this enters because it does not seem to stay really local, but it goes all over the body, right? And that could be an issue in certain uh, organs and other parts of your body where this might not be the result that we actually intended it to have. So again, these are vast differences uh, between these technologies. One push why the pharmaceutical companies want to do this, of course, is they say, well, we can do it much faster, we can do it more accurately, we can respond faster to a new pathogen, and that might be correct. Um, but of course, there's also financial incentives because when you think of traditional vaccines, those patents have long expired. And when you think of this new technology, I mean, there's certainly a host of patents that can be made. And there certainly, uh, is, this is financially much more lucrative, of course, right? So these are really big differences. Um, and, you know, I think we need a lot more data to have really good safety signals to see if this is a good thing. Um, and I think until we have that, I am uh, uh, actually very much against going in the direction of implementing this new technology. Again, we have very good traditional vaccines. I think they have worked very well. I'm very thankful that we don't have smallpox anymore and that we have eradicated polio. But even there, sometimes with traditional vaccines, we had issues for a while. Um, initially, we gave like a live polio. That was a problem. There were actually some polio cases from that, then they changed it, you know, now it's a, now it's a dead uh, a pathogen that gets injected. So it's, it's, a, it's a different way to do this now. So we learn sometimes from mistakes. But here again, this is a whole new technology that works very, very differently than our traditional platforms did. And with that comes, of course, a host of long-term issues that we don't really understand yet, in my opinion. Even when we read papers, you know, I mean, again, the, the studies will also say about efficacy. <laughs> And this was interesting in the Senate hearings. So they said, well, look, we've saved so and so many lives, millions of lives were saved. Um, that is really hard to argue because, again, yes, the vaccines were rolled out and after that, um, the mortality declined. But it was also that the virus had changed tremendously. The virus mutated into weaker and weaker forms. At the same time, we rolled out treatments that were very good, starting from, from steroids to repurposed medications and so on. And we knew how to treat it better. So all these factors need to be taken into consideration. We can't just say, well, there were less uh, deaths after the rollout of that particular vaccine. And, uh, you know, there are many factors that we have to consider before we can make a statement like that. So I think it's important to understand that there are vast differences. I think with any new technology, I'm very hesitant always um, about uh, uh, changing things that work well. And I always want to know, well, why are we actually doing this? Is it just a financial incentive to roll out things that are more monetizable? Or are there real advantages why this would be much, much, much better than an old technology? And can it show the safety signal that we need to implement this? And at this point, I would say in this technology, I'm very hesitant and I have a lot of concerns about it. So I would uh, love to see a lot more research on safety signals before <laughs> this goes in that direction. And also for the general population in terms of our uh, confidence and our trust in the medical system, unless these data are presented, and as long as there's actually uh, fights to suppress data, you know, people are going to have trust in this. And I don't blame them because, again, this data needs to be discussed. We need to look at all these adverse reactions that, uh, that have happened that sort certainly are not discussed in the uh, detail that they deserve. And uh, we talk, should really look at the patient population that has been adversely affected because, again, in this technology so far, we've seen a lot more adverse reactions than we had with traditional vaccines. The argument will be made, well, we had to roll out something worldwide and more people were using it and all that. But still, even taking all this into consideration, I think there were a lot of risks with this one. And I think we need to really uh, evaluate this right now, as we should, you know, as, uh, as scientists, we should look at this and really understand it very, very well before making recommendations to push in that direction. So at the moment, I, I would certainly prefer uh, traditional platforms that we had. They work well. I'm fine with it. We should always um, critically evaluate even those. Do we need all of them? Do we need to give it in the, in the schedule that we're giving them? And that's also very valid questions, you know. Vaccines and medications, like any other medication, they should be scrutinized and they should be regularly evaluated for safety and efficacy. And yes, we do need trials also going forward, uh, possibly with uh, placebo groups, to really show efficacy. I know there's some pushback against that as well. But I think we need to have that to really say, hey, look, here is how much better you fare when you take this. Because um, until recently, this data hasn't been very good. And even in things that are existing, I think we should continuously study these things to make absolutely sure that it's safe, especially when we think about who are the main recipients of these vaccines, those are children. And we have to do right by our children and protect them. I think it's very important that we do all these studies very rigorously before pushing any new technology.